Buddha was tempted by the three daughters. Eh? So he, while meditating under a banyan tree, three most charming girls called Tanha, which means craving, Rati means passion, and Raga, lust, came to disturb his meditation. Right, so this is like a popular story. Uh, you can even find it in the you know, the little Buddha movie. Um, so this actually did not happen, according to the suttas. Uh, this incident happens seven years after the Buddha got enlightened. So the Buddha, I mean, the Mara's daughters and the Buddha have not met until seven years after the Buddha achieved enlightenment. Then, uh, you know, while Mara looks very dejected, you know, after years of trying to persuade the Buddha and looks upset, then the daughters, <clears throat> the daughters of Mara try to cheer him up, cheer their father, and try to uh, uh, su try to succeed where their father failed, but in the end, they also failed. Eh? So you can find in this particular suttas in the Samyutta Nikaya. Okay, uh, next. <clears throat> okay, so what happens in that fifth week, uh, according to the Mahakandaka, which is the Vinaya edition, is uh, actually the invitation by Brahma Sampati. So this uh, statue which you see on the left, the picture, uh, you can find it, I think, in most Theravada temples should, uh, you know, some of them would have this Brahma statue. So a lot of people kind of uh, mistaken it as the four-faced Buddha or misname it as the four-faced Buddha. So in actuality, uh, there's no four-faced Buddha. It's actually this Brahma Sampati. Okay, so I'll just read through uh, the story. After seven days, the Buddha came out from that stillness and went from the ape flower tree to a goat herd's banyan tree. So he went to another tree, and he stayed there. Then, while reflecting in private, the Buddha thought this. What I've discovered with difficulty, there's no point in making it known. For those overcome by sensual desire and ill will, this truth is hard to understand. Right, so the Buddha uh, no, toiled for six years, uh, he, you know, he been through all the different kinds of meditations. He knew how hard, how much effort you need to overcome uh, sensual pleasure and craving. So you find that for most people, it's kind of uh, very hard. Yeah. Those who are excited by sensual desire, obstructed by a mass of darkness, won't see what goes against the stream. What subtle and refined, profound and hard to see. And that would be wearying and troublesome for me. Right? So uh, the f first, uh, I mean, the third paragraph talks about uh, people who are addicted, right? Uh, still enjoy sensual desires. It's still following the stream, a uh, stream of craving. So the journey, the journey to enlightenment is actually going against the stream, right? So it's like an upward stream, very hard to, uh, to cross. What's subtle and refined? Eh? That means the state of mind, the levels of concentration, levels of insight, and uh, even enlightenment. All these are very refined and subtle states of mind. And it's not easy to... to uh, teach eh? and to let people experience. When the Buddha reflected like this, he inclined to inactivity, not to teaching. <clears throat> so the Buddha actually decided not to teach, right? Initially, when he kind of uh, left his palace, he wanted to overcome this uh, birth, aging, sickness, and death. Right, so he found the truth, and then he found it. Ah, yeah, this one uh, cannot, or rather, hard to teach other people. Right, so uh, he decided not to teach anymore. 
Sampati next. Brahma Sampati read the mind of the Buddha. He thought, the world is lost. It's perished. For the Buddha, perfected and fully awakened, inclines to inaction, not to teaching. So there's like uh, some kind of God in the heaven, right? some uh, God protocols. So this uh, Brahma Sampati, right, um, which is depicted in now in the picture uh, on the right, right, earlier on on the left, he has four faces. So again, it's all artist depiction. Huh? Appeared in front of the Buddha. He put his upper robe over one shoulder, placed his right knee on the ground, raised his joint palms and said, Please teach, Venerable Sir, please teach. There are beings with little dust in their eyes who are ruined because of not hearing the teaching. There will be those who understand. Right, so he made this request uh, three times and twice the Buddha repeated to uh, Brahma Sampati what he had thought. Okay, the Buddha... <coughs> uh, okay, so previous slide, sorry. Right, so um, what the Buddha thought was earlier eh, that uh, beings are hard to teach and because of this sensuality. So uh, the Buddha had to repeat twice, but Brahma Sampati requested the third time. So after the third time, then uh, this time, the next slide. The Buddha understood the request of the Supreme Being. Then with the eye of uh, Buddha, he surveyed the world out of compassion for sentient beings. He saw beings with little dust in their eyes and with much dust in their eyes. Easy to teach and difficult to teach. Right? So earlier on, when the Buddha was inclined to inactivity, he didn't bother to check. <laughs> he didn't bother to survey the world. So after only uh, Brahma Sampati requested three times that he insists that, okay, there are um, uh, people with little dust in their eyes, no use, uh, please teach. Then the Buddha is like, sure not, huh? sure about people with little dust. Not. Uh, so he went to use his ability called the uh, Buddha eye to survey the world. Right. So uh, you, you might, or rather sometimes we might come across this term Buddha eye. Uh, for example, like the story of Angulimala, uh, the Buddha occasionally like use the Buddha eye to scan the world to see whether there's potential uh, arising uh, students, right? So, uh, so the Buddha found that okay, there are people with little dust in their eyes, just like lotuses sprouted and grown in a lotus pond. Some remain submerged in the water without rising, without rising out of it. Others reach the surface of the water while others still rise out of the water without being touched by it. Right? So the Buddha gave an analogy of the lotus growing out of the mud. Right? So you see the diagram, the Buddha picking up the lotuses. Right? So lotus in Buddhism is a symbol of purity. Right? So some people's mind are still deep inside the mud, still uh, you know, very hard to get out. Some are near the surface, so it's easier to blossom, to grow, and others are already like outside. Right? So uh, these are you know, different uh, kinds of beings. Some are easier to teach. Uh, so the Buddha agreed to Sampati in this. Open to them are the doors to the deathless. May those who here release their faith, seeing trouble, supreme being, I did not speak the sublime and subtle truth. So again, it is <clears throat> not uh, easy to teach uh, the Dhamma. Uh, as you know, if you really know the Buddha's life story, sometimes he's subjected to uh, assassination attempts or being uh, framed or being uh, how to call it uh, backmouth. You no know, people who frame him, 
uh, there's women, there's a women chincha pretend to be pregnant and frame the Buddha for causing her pregnancy and that kind of stuff. So lots of people want to uh, take down the Buddha. Now, once you introduce a new teaching, sometimes it kind of rock the old establishment. You know, like maybe some uh, uh, faith already believe, okay, there is, a, for example, like a soul. You know, there's a soul and there's a ultimate being and stuff like that. So when the Buddha's teaching kind of spread, then you have some very different concepts. So it kind of, uh, in a way, like take away the disciples or the devotees of the other faith. Right? So it can be uh, disturbing to other groups of people. So there will be some political uh, disputes also. Um, we will we'll talk about it in some other time. Huh? Uh, so, so the Buddha did not want to teach, not, not because of all these problems, uh, but because, I mean, adding on to beings who have lots of dust in their eyes, then you have all these surrounding social, political issues, you know, where it's subject to you know, assassination attempts and being sabotaged. So it's like, okay, better not, better not teach. Right? So he sees the danger initially, he doesn't want to teach, but because there are potential beings who have little dust in their eyes, able to reach enlightenment, then the Buddha is like, okay. Next slide. Oh, that's it. Okay, so that's the end of the sharing. This is the last uh, segment. Uh, so after this incident, then he started to you know, travel and look for the five companions. So initially he searched for uh, the two teachers you know, that taught him the formless concentrations, huh? this Alara Kalama and Udaka Ramaputta. And both of them passed away huh, into these uh, formless heavens, this uh, Arupa Jhana heavens. So it's kind of like, you no, know, somehow cannot teach over there. Uh, so he looked for the next best candidate, which are the first, uh, I mean, the five companions. And the Buddha decided to head there to look for them. So it's at the Deer Park. Okay, so that ends the sharing. Any questions? Since today's on uh, is Brahma Viharas, I mean on the Brahma Sampati, then we'll talk about or practice this Brahma Viharas. Okay, uh, find a comfortable sitting posture, make sure your back is upright and the rest of the body relaxed. Okay, so the first thing we are going to do is uh, feel, uh, feel the sensations of the entire body from head to toe as a whole. And we just pick up whatever sensation, uh, obvious sensations appearing. And we mentally wish it well and happy. So we call this mindfulness of the, uh, maybe I use the five aggregates. Huh? So the form aggregate will consist of four elements, earth, fire, wind, water elements, Earth represents any heart or soft sensations. Fire is hot and cold. Wind is the fast, low movements. And water is the moist or dry sensations. So whatever sensation appear, we wish it well and happy. No need to control, huh? no controlling. Let it appear naturally by itself. And the second aggregate, you have feeling. Sometimes you may find the sensations comfortable, sometimes they're not comfortable, sometimes they're painful, 
Sometimes they are neutral. So whatever feeling appear, we also make peace with them, make friends with them, wish them well and happy. And the third aggregate is called perception. The, whatever labels or experiences from the past, you try to label that experience then uh, that's called perception. Huh? Why do you call this earth element? Why do you call this fire element? So that is perception. And every time you generate a thought, that is actually mental formation. And by being aware of all these sensations, that is using consciousness. So if you're feeling the sensations, you're using the body consciousness. So we have six types of consciousness, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. So if you're hearing my voice, then you're, that's using the ear consciousness. So all the aggregates, we stick with the elements. These are the most obvious sensations. Why don't you pay attention to that? All five aggregates will be present. So we are not training to control the elements. We are actually learning to make peace in the five aggregates and eventually learning to let them go. So the middle way is to you know, first have right thoughts. Yeah, whatever sensation appears, we wish them well and happy. That's to reduce aversion. And once you finish the sentence, repeat the sentence again. Huh? That repetition is called right effort. So if we are applying all this right thought, right effort and everything, we are using uh, the fourth noble truth. Huh? That means using the noble eightfold path to overcome craving and suffering. And if you do it correctly, it should lead to the third noble truth. That means the craving and stress should reduce so this is your own troubleshooting mechanism. But if the more you meditate, the more stressful you become, when the more you drift off, then that means that's the first two noble truths, eh? clinging and suffering. So the more you wish in this uh, sensations well and happy, it should come down to uh, like a certain point. And once it is relatively calm, then we call this the baseline emotion. So the baseline emotion is a neutral state, no jhani concentrations, no insight. So that will be the minimum requirement 
or insight for those who want to go into insight. But right now we are going to move on uh, to the boundless loving kindness. So we are going to wish all beings in all directions well and happy. Above, below and all across all directions. And there's no need to push or expand the mind. Let it extend naturally by itself. However far it wish to extend doesn't matter. And in that widened sphere of attention, we are going to perceive all beings as the four elements or the five aggregates. So there's no need to visualize. Huh? So we're using the non-discrimination approach. So whatever aggregates that you can detect, we are going to wish may all beings be well and happy. All beings are made of these aggregates. And they may these sensations may appear inside the body or outside the body, near or far, doesn't matter. Once you detect something, may all beings be well and happy. So we keep repeating that. Eh? And if the conditions are right, you have the uh, right thought, right effort and everything, it should trigger this right concentration. So usually the first sublime state will lead to the first level of concentration. So if let's say the neutral emotion from earlier has uh, increased in this pleasant emotion, there's some joy and happiness, and there's a greater kind of peace, and that would be the indicator for the first level of concentration. And regardless of what you experience, keep on labeling may all beings be well and happy keep repeating the right thought keep uh, rowing the boat against the stream keep paddling against the stream because once you stop thinking and the mind will drift off eh?
And now we add some insight, some wisdom, and we are going to reflect on impermanence. So we synchronize with the sensations and label impermanence, or we can use any word or phrase associated with impermanence. You can use rising and falling, birth and death, anicca, change. Just pick a favorite and keep repeating. So if there is real detachment taking place, there shouldn't be like a short surge of joy appearing for a while. And whatever happens, you treat everything as a byproduct, keep on labeling impermanence. If, let's say, the joy and happiness all subside, one may experience like this uh, alert or refreshing experience. Yeah, um, Then we call this equanimity, normally associated with the fourth level of concentration. So if you want to you know, be reborn in a world where this Brahma Sampati is around, then uh, keep on reflecting on impermanence.
So in this uh, inside portion, when you think of impermanence, uh, there is like no limit to settling the mind. It's actually a long journey against the stream of craving. Eh? It's a long journey, long stream. So the only way to stay on a course against the stream is to keep rowing the pedal, keep labeling impermanence. And then we can move on to the second sublime state, which is compassion. So for compassion, the same thing, uh, non-discrimination approach for beings, as long as they cling on to the five aggregates, and that will be suffering. So whenever we detect any sensation, that's actually the five aggregates, then we need to apply the right thought. May all beings be free from suffering. So try not to dramatize and create stories. Eh? So that's uh, basically entanglement. If you create stories, start to worry and plan how to help this person. Is that person okay? And there will be clinging, eh? clinging to the five aggregates. where we apply some right view, turning to overcome uh, the five aggregates or whatever sensation appear, may all beings be free from suffering.
if the conditions are right you have all the uh, right thought right effort and everything it will trigger this right concentration so usually the second sublime state will activate the second level of concentration so if your compassion can feel joyful then that would be the indicator for the second level of concentration And regardless of what you experience, keep on wishing all beings free from suffering. Eh? All these uh, pleasant states of mind or calm states of mind, once you cling onto them, that's also clinging to the five aggregates. Okay, then we can add some insight, some wisdom, so we can reflect that um, how to overcome uh, this suffering. We are actually learning to uncling from the five clinging aggregates. So we are using the reflection of impermanence. So the same thing, any sensation appeared, and we synchronize and label with the impermanence. So even the joy and happiness disappear instead of the equanimity from previously. This time round, it should feel a bit more blank or spacey. So we call that experience the perception of infinite space. So regardless of what you experience, keep on labeling impermanence. And that's to prevent getting lost in space.
and now we switch to the third sublime state which is appreciative joy and we're going to rejoice in the accomplishments of all beings so using the non-discrimination approach all beings uh, every moment to experience the five aggregates the four elements whether they are winners or losers uh, likewise we are the same thing we also experience these elements and sensations all the time so whatever sensation appears we can rejoice with all beings So the term appreciative joy, huh? to appreciate, and it's more like showing gratitude and contentment. Okay, if all the conditions are right, you have all the right thought, right effort, everything, then the mind should, I um, mean, should trigger the third level of concentration denoted by the emotion of happiness. So it's a different pleasant emotion from the first two sublime states. So regardless of what you experience, keep on rejoicing with all beings. And then we add some insight, some wisdom, and we're going to reflect that all beings will eventually be separated from what they have achieved. So every sensation, they don't stay with us 24-7, and they come and go every moment. So every time sensation uh, appear we synchronize with the label impermanence.
Yeah, let's say the joy and happiness start to disappear instead of the blankness from previously. This time around, it should be the opposite, a sense of fullness, as though the sense of self has merged with the entire surroundings. And we call that experience the perception of infinite consciousness. And the same thing, regardless of what you experience, keep on labeling impermanence, treat everything else as a byproduct. We then can switch to the fourth sublime state, which is equanimity. And in this routine, we are going to reflect on the concept of karma. We do not need to speculate what we've done in the past. Yeah, so how we're going to do it is we have a general idea that all beings are subject to karma. So whatever sensation appear, we just need to label karmas ripening, old karmas ripening. Whatever we experience here and now has to have a past cause, but we do not need to know the details of the past cause. So we just need to use the real-time evidence. Whatever appears, we just label karmas ripening. So if it's a pleasant sensation, then probably good karma is ripening. If it's an unpleasant sensation, then probably bad karma is ripening. And if it's a neutral sensation, then neutral karma is ripening. So in short, all sensations, you just label karma as ripening.
If all the conditions are right and the mind is more accepting towards karma, then one may experience this neutral and refreshing experience again. So we call that equanimity, normally associated with the fourth level of concentration. And regardless of what you experience, just keep label, keep labeling karmas ripening. And then we add some insight, some reflection. And we can reflect how to overcome these karmas or transcend karmas. Or whatever, whenever good karma ripen, you feel happy, bad karma ripen, feel sad. So this is like a mood swing kind of problem. So every time we detect any sensation, we just keep labeling impermanence. Eh? Whether is it pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feelings, just keep labeling impermanence.
if let's say the joy and happiness disappear, uh, one may experience as though like things disappear, eh? even more blank than the blankness. So that experience, we call it the perception of nothingness. And it's still part of the five aggregates. So regardless of what you experience, keep on labeling impermanence.
And before we conclude this session, a same gentle reminder in all activities, whether we're standing, sitting, walking, or lying down, we can maintain this boundless, sublime state or always be mindful of impermanence. And with that, we can gently open our eyes, formally end the session, informally generate right thought. Hey, any questions or problems from anyone? All okay? Right. Uh, if there's no issues, then we move on to the dedication. <clears throat> yeah, and Modana. Dedicating merits. Akasata Chapumata Devanaga Mahitika Punyang Tang Anumoditwa Chirang Rakan to Loka Sasana Eta Vata Chaam Hehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Deva Sabe Puta Sabe Sata Anumodan to Saba Sampati Sitiya Dedication of marriage to departed. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita ho tu nyata yo. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita ho tu nyata yo. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita ho tu nyata yo. Aspiration. Imina punya kame na ma me bala samagamo. Satang samagamo ho tu yavani bana patiya sadu sadu sadu. And we pay respects to the Buddha by buying three times. <clears throat> <clears throat> 